woke up this morning I asked myself, what are the valuable lessons that I can learn from what's going on in the world today? We have a deadly virus putting everything on pause and dispersing throughout the globe like a wildfire. Meanwhile, quarantine, lockdown, social distancing, no jobs and no schools, anxiety on elevation while solitude is our new adaptation. I'm just here to tell you to hold on, stay in and stay safe. Like MJ, put on your mask and your gloves and let's beat it. Soon we shall overcome and celebrate better days ahead. Please allow me to paint you a brighter picture. Please let me share with you the positive side of the agony that we have been enduring. Ever since the world shut down, we've had less pollution and nature has been flourishing. Ever since Corona started, many nations at war have ceased fire. Now imagine the peace it brought to the heart of children in war zones all across the world. Yemen, South Sudan, Syria, Ukraine, Cameroon, and many other places. Black or white, Buddhist or atheist, harmony in different languages, religion and science. Yes, we can all coexist and express love, because it's the answer. It's the other way to go. It's the only thing that brings us It's a beautiful thing that heals us It's a wonderful thing that takes us higher Brings us closer Don't deny it, just embrace it Express it Express it One love Let it flow across the globe One love Now when we do go back to school, remember there are kids in other parts of the world who haven't seen a classroom in years due to war or poverty. Now when we do get back to normal, take it easy. Life is not a race. The most important thing is not money. The most important thing is the memories that we create while living. So cherish them. Be compassionate. Treat others with respect. Help someone in need if you can. Now when we do get back to normal, remember to salute a healthcare worker because they are the unsung heroes. Thank you. I'm gonna be a better me and celebrate life. And love is what I'm gonna use to elevate. I promise I'ma shed away the negative weight. World peace, that's all I wanna propagate. It's the only thing that brings us. It's a beautiful thing that heals us. It's a wonderful thing that takes us higher Brings us closer, don't deny it Just embrace it, express it Express it One love Let it flow across the globe One love Let it flow across the globe Wow, that was awesome. What did you guys think? One love. <laughs> you can do better than that. What did you guys think? Now we're talking. So you just heard MDG, and it recognizes the pain and the trauma that the world has gone through uh, over the last couple of years. But it's still positive, and it points, out, points us all out to a bright future. So thank you, Mr. Bangura. And I have to give him a shout out, because I'm reading my notes, and I see he's from Sierra Leone. Is that correct? He's from Sierra Leone, and so am I. So let's hear it for the Sierra Leoneans. <laughs> so everybody, my name is Hawa Maria Diallo. I am the chief of the Civil Society Unit at the United Nations Department of Global Communications here at the UN headquarters. I proudly serve the United Nations. <laughs> I proudly serve the United Nations and have been doing that for about 34 years. I started in kindergarten, in case you're wondering. <laughs> and I support the advocacy and the communication efforts of the United Nations to really engage uh, with civil society in spreading awareness about the UN's work. I especially work with youth-led organizations from across the globe uh, especially in the Global South. So it's a pleasure, pleasure, pleasure really for me to be here with you today. Welcome to the United Nations. So let's get the show on the road. Um, Mr. Deputy Permanent Representative of the Mission of Nigeria to the United Nations, members of the board of the African Renaissance and Diaspora Network, Arden, Queen Makahezi, who flew all the way, came all the way from South Africa to be with us here today. Honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the United Nations as we celebrate Africa and Africa Day 2022. 
Now the younger ones, I'm gonna include myself there too, <laughs> amongst us, might not know that Africa Day, May 25, marks the date in 1963 when 30 newly independent African countries came together in Addis Ababa to form the, African, uh, to form the Organization of African Unity. It's an important date, and today while we are in the, this glorious chamber, uh, take a look at it around us, it's really ironic as well. This is the Trusteeship Council. It's a part of the UN, an organ in a room that has played an essential role in African countries and many other countries around the world in terms of gaining their independence. Now, I started my work at the UN as a tour guide. I used to talk about this room all the time. If I remember, this is the room from, I hope, Denmark. Am I correct? There are some tour guides here. And you have the beautiful statue, which is over here on the side, which is really symbolic of, uh, you know, people rising from uh, um, non-self-governing um, a statehood to independence. Now, I'm talking a lot, but I'm really not here to make speeches. I'm really here to guide you along this journey today and to get the show on the way. And I will get started by calling on Honorable Constance Newman, Chair of the Board of Arden and former Assistant Secretary General of State for Africa in the Bush administration here in the United States. She will make her remarks with us today via video. Welcome to the African Renaissance and Diaspora Network Africa Day celebration. It makes sense for all of us to celebrate the founding of the predecessor to the African Union. It makes sense for all of us to celebrate the continent with the greatest promise for the future. It makes sense for us to consider with the youth important sustainable development goals. And in these trying times, it makes sense for us to join together the people of the world in a positive, pleasant occasion. This year's program of Arden, the African Renaissance and Diaspora Network, and with our partners, dedicated to the youth and the young adults of Africa and the diaspora. You may ask, why should Africa Day be dedicated to the youth and the young adults? Well, I'm going to share four reasons. First one, the youth and young adults of Africa and the diaspora have something of interest to say. All of us can learn from them because they often have to offer new ideas about social activism, music, art, fashion, unique fabric designs, dance, cuisines, sporting accomplishments, and technological advancement. Second reason, today over 70% of the population of Sub-Saharan Africa are under the age of 30. There is simply strength in numbers. The third reason we must understand the youth's legitimate concerns about ensuring the health and well-being of all. And as the theme of our red card campaign vows, the elimination of gender disparities, which deny millions and millions women and girls the opportunities for self-realization. And the fourth reason, the fourth reason is the promise for the future is our youth. Therefore, they must be given the opportunity to be a part of the solution. They must have a seat at all tables. They must be a part of the serious discussions about the relationship between culture and development. What is to be turned away and kept in the development of leaders, and how to be an effective partner in the complicated, interrelated world of which they are 
to be critical contributors. So I encourage one and all to join this celebration of Africa Day, to learn from and at the same time enjoy hearing from the youth and the young adults of Africa and the diaspora. And now, and now for the program. Newman. A big thank you goes to Ms. Newman. Really, her remarks have uh, set the tone for the rest of the event. I thank her for really putting a spotlight on the young people on the continent and making all those uh, linkages that are so important in supporting their leadership and civic uh, uh, participation. Now, I really have a really big honor uh, to call the next speaker, the president and the CEO of uh, Arden, to welcome you all to this event. It's really special to me uh, because Jabril Diallo really has been a pillar, not only in the United Nations for many years, but in the lives of many people um, like myself. Um, at the UN, proving himself to be a leader uh, when he was with UNICEF, UNDP, the Office for Youth and Sports, as the Chief Advisor to the Executive Officer of UNAIDS, and he himself becoming the head of the regional office for UN AIDS in Western and Central Africa. I don't think that he would mind me saying that um, he came from humble, uh, a humble background, uh, not from wealth. His mother struggled to get him an education, and at the same point, his thirst for knowledge and innate in uh, abilities took him forward. He really is a special person to me. I hope I don't get emotional. And I think a special person in the lives, as I said, is so many people, because he's always there supporting, uh, giving advice, mentoring, putting other people's um, um, you know, desires and aspirations before himself. And that's what makes him really the man that he is. So I now give the floor to my colleague, but most important to me, my biggest mentor, Dr. Dribble Diallo. Thank you, thank you very much for that uh, warm uh, welcome. Uh, it's uh, amazing to have each and every one of you be here today because the last time I had the opportunity to speak to you physically here at the United Nations headquarters was on Friday, 5th of March, 2020. 6 p.m. on that day, many of you will remember, the United Nations was closed due to COVID-19. And uh, since then, the United Nations has remained uh, closed due to all the situations that we all know about. And this is one of the first major gatherings that are happening. And it's not by chance that the last event that happened before the United Nations closed was an event to launch the red card, to give a red card to all forms of discrimination and violence against women and girls. We will come back to that in a moment. And the second one, and very important one, is to celebrate Africa, the birth of humanity. So that uh, those are two meaningful words, which I wanted to make sure that uh, we take them into account uh, by, first of all, addressing my appreciations to you, your excellencies, to you, the honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, our wonderful and outstanding uh, moderator, our Diallo, here present. It is therefore my great pleasure, on behalf of the African Renaissance and Diaspora Network, to welcome you to this 
2022 edition of Africa Day. And I'm so glad that we have this opportunity to connect in person. Africa Day, as was mentioned before, commemorates the day when, in 1963, the uh, countries who were, which were independent then at the time, 30 countries, got together and formed what was called the Organization of African Unity, OAU. They signed uh, that uh, charter. And now, let me again come back to one point that uh, the moderator mentioned, which is uh, the, we chose to have the celebrations in this room because this room has a lot of meanings. The Trusteeship Council Chambers. The Trusteeship Council Chambers was established by the United Nations to oversee the decolonization of the then dependent territories from colonial times. There were 11 territories, not just from Africa, a majority were from Africa, but 11 territories that were placed under the trusteeship system. And these included territories now which are part of modern Nigeria, modern Cameroon, Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania, Togo, Ghana, and Somalia, all of which, when they were independent, became original members of the Organization of African Unity. As was mentioned before, we decided that this edition of Africa Day will be dedicated to the youth of Africa and to the youth of the diaspora. Very, very important element because the youth are not the leaders of tomorrow, they're the leaders of today. That's why we wanted to recognize them, not just in terms of the physical continent of, the, of the, uh, Africa, but also the diaspora, because as you know, the African Union has declared the diaspora as the sixth region of Africa. We at the African Renaissance and Diaspora Network want to reinforce that and make sure that we breathe life into it so that uh, to have the youth be here is, uh, is very, very important, and that is within the framework of the ARDN red card campaign. Women's rights are human rights. And in the game of football, what you call in the United States, in the game of soccer, when you have a red card, that symbolizes significant infraction of the rules. And as you know, when you have a red card, what happens? You get thrown out of the field. So we want to throw out of the field any kind of form of discrimination and violence against women and girls. The ARDN red card recognizes that gender-based violence and discrimination in all its manifestations are serious violations of human rights and they have no place in and off the football field. In this light, today's celebrations are particularly focused upon celebrating the promise, celebrating the power, and celebrating the potential of women and girls, as well as highlighting efforts by young people to uplift and empower women and girls. Fittingly, as was mentioned, I would like to draw your attention to that wooden statue on the right side of this chamber. It depicts a young girl with arms upraised and a bird hovering with outspread wings above her head. The statue, which was given by uh, Denmark, symbolizes humankind and hope. Indeed, young women carry the hope of humankind. This was true 
when these chambers were built, and this is true today. And in this uh, connection, I would like you to, I would like to politely ask you to stand up, please. <clears throat> I would like you to do the following, please. You can join hands, elbows, fists, or spirits. Whichever you are most comfortable with. And close your eyes, please. We're going to commit to a moment of silence to do everything possible individually and collectively to make sure that the day of violence and discrimination against women and girls is a day to be erased from the face of this planet. Thank you. You may be seated. The hope of humankind on the African continent, the African diaspora in every corner of the world, is around the red card. So I would like you to do me a favor. Pick up your cell phones, please. And look at the red card. And do me a favor, it takes one minute. And sign your pledge. www.redcardpledge.com We need one million signatures. And your presence here. And the presence of those who are watching us online. Because this event is being webcast worldwide. Will also make that difference. Please take a minute and sign your pledge, www.redcardpledge.com. Speaking of hope, one of the highlights of today's agenda is the unveiling of the Red Card Campaign theme song. The song is produced by our ARDN Goodwill Ambassador, Abbas Mubarak Akeju, here present. And the song features five powerful young women who have come together to lend their vision and their voice to inspire us to create the Africa, the world that we all want. Which world do we want? We want a world where no one is left behind. We in the African Renaissance and Diaspora Network believe that young people are the leaders of today, and today we will also hear stories of eight pace setters for development. Young women and men who are working to create a better Africa, a better world. I would like to share with you, finally, the elements that compose the African Renaissance and Diaspora Network, an international NGO headquartered in New York with partnership agreements with the United Nations. Our job is to try and popularize the sustainable development goals in Africa and the diaspora using four entry points very quickly. One, partnership with the youth, strengthening the ties between the youth of Africa and the youth of the diaspora. Number two, bridging the gender gap. The United Nations has determined that no country in the world treats its women as well as it does its men, 193 countries. So we've got to fight the apartheid of gender as forcefully as we fought apartheid in South Africa. So bridging the gender gap. Number three, education, improving the quality of education, especially higher education. Number four, mayors as a peg around which we articulate our initiatives by having sister city relations. When you have all of those, they should be wrapped around a very strong communication strategy. 
the Africa that we see very often in the international media is not the Africa that we would want to see. And that's why we're very, very happy to have here a major correspondent from the daughter of Africa, Zain Asher, here from CNN, here present. We want to have the Africa of the Islands of Hope in addition to the other Africa which is there. So the communication strategy is very, very important. Finally, I would like to thank the co-sponsors of this uh, major event. To start with, uh, the permanent mission of Nigeria to the United Nations under the leadership of Ambassador Tijani Mohamed Bande. And the mission is ably represented here by Minister Plenipotentiary Namdi Okechukwu Nze, here present. Let's welcome, please. We have also the African Union, the Permanent Observer Mission of the African Union to the United Nations, under the leadership of Ambassador Fatima Kiari Mohammed, and the African Union here is represented by Mohammed Bagobiri, Political Affairs Officer. Welcome again another time. The Executive Director of UNFPA, Dr. Natalia Kanem, has been a great supporter of the African Renaissance and Diaspora Network, and she will be represented through a video message by Dr. Jenna Keita, who is the Deputy Executive Director of UNFPA. <laughs> UN Women too will be represented by the Deputy Executive Director through a video message. UNDP Africa has been a very strong partner under the leadership of Assistant Secretary General Ahuna Ezekonwa. And UN Habitat is also a co-sponsor of ARDN's activities under the leadership of the Executive Director Maimouna Ahmad Sharif. Again, Howard Yalo and her team worked tirelessly to make this happen. I would like to thank uh, you, Ahawa, and your team of the UN Department of Global Communications for your partnership. Thank you very much again. <laughs> we have Queen Makadzi, who's uh, traveled all the way from uh, South Africa. Uh, she's on her way here, uh, and uh, she is the uh, queen uh, that has come all the way from South Africa to be our special guest, and she's coming over, so I want to thank you again and welcome you, Queen Makadzi. <laughs> we will have during the program, all the way from Central America, Her Excellency Epsi Campbell Ba who is the member of the newly formed United Nations Permanent Forum for People of African Descent, and she was the former first vice president of the Republic of Costa Rica. So she will be connecting with us, a black woman occupying that high position from the perspective of the diaspora, Epsi Campbell Barr. We will also have Uli Keita, the executive director of Youth Connect Africa, who will be speaking to us from uh, Rwanda. Of course, uh, we have I would like to also thank uh, the uh, president of uh, Berkeley College, Dr. Diane Resinos. We are very, very happy to have you. Please stand up so that we can just recognize you, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Resinos uh, has been ably supported and also uh, contributions made by uh, the senior advisor of ARDN on celebrities and the private sector engagement, uh, Buzi Matsiko here present. Buzi, thank you very much again. <laughs> and we have now the honor uh, to give uh, the welcome to Queen uh, Makadzi another way. Thank you very much. And as I said, uh, we have introduced a, uh, the Goodwill Ambassador of uh, ARDN, uh, Akeju here present, who will be speaking in a moment. And with that, again, I would like to 
thank each and every one of you because as they say in my home language in Africa, when you start naming names, you're always in trouble because you always forget somebody. So at the United Nations, we say all protocol observed. So we have observed all protocol. Thank you very much. And Hawa, over to you, please. Thank you so much, Jabril. Um, you know, thanks for really putting a spotlight on the work of, uh, of, of ARDN and for really giving us an idea of what the pillars are. And as I was listening to you, one thing really came to my mind. I kept seeing you mentioning strong and powerful women and the fact that, you know, we need to uplift women around the world, especially in the global south, especially in the continent. And, you know, all those UN agencies you mentioned, each and every one of them, they're, uh, they're headed by strong women. So I, w I want to think that the UN is getting it right, that we're doing something right. <laughs> now, your words were very inspiring, and it's clear that although you've transitioned from your career and your work at the United Nations, uh, Jibril, uh, your mission uh, continues, serving Africa, serving people of African descent, serving uh, people of the world. Give it up, you all. You can do better than that. For me, for me, it's clear that uh, you, know, you are an international civil, civil servant to the bone because your work doesn't stop. I had the privilege of visiting uh, Senegal uh, a couple of months ago, and I saw Jibril Diallo in action, and I just kept saying, what am I doing in America? What am I doing? <laughs> I've got to come here in Senegal and join the network. So I know that, um, as we say here, you know, uh, you put your, is it you put, put your money where your mouth is. He gets the job done. So thank you so much for your selfless service. And thank you really for giving us hope. Now, Uh, Jabril mentioned that we are live, so we are on UN Web TV. Uh, we're also beaming on uh, uh, YouTube. So please uh, use the hashtag. I think it's on all of our screens in front of us. Hashtag ARDN Red Card. Let's take this message outside Trusteeship Council. Let's get it out there. Let's kick it out of this room and make sure we spread the message around with your help. <laughs> Now I want to call on the representative of the uh, Permanent Observer of the African Union uh, mission to the United Nations, uh, Mr. Mohamed Bogobiri, to deliver his message. Over to you, Mr. Bogobiri. Uh, thank you, Hawa. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Jibril. It is an honor for us to be here to receive your invitation. And uh, I must um, confess the ARDN, the African Ren uh, Renaissance and Diaspora Network, they have been uh, complementing the work of the African Union. So I wish to congratulate Mr. Jibril for a very uh, uh, job well done for all that he's been doing. Can you just give him a round of applause, please? <laughs> yes, thank you. It is an honor to be invited here. And uh, although my ambassador, Ambassador Fatima, she wanted to come, but of course, she was also, she's currently hosting another Africa Day event uh, in a, a different venue. So, uh, but she has this statement, which I am going to present um, right now. Thank you. Uh, brothers and sisters of Africa and the diaspora, ladies and gentlemen, on May 25th of every year, we commemorate the birth of the OAU, a unique time in history when 25 African heads of state established our continental organization. Since the establishment of the African Union 20 years later, we continue to pursue the ambition laid out by our founding fathers to the Africa we want. Our Continental Framework Agenda 2063, founded on the AU vision of an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa, driven by its own citizens and presenting a dynamic force in the international arena, remains the blueprint for achieving our ambitions. Uh, the AU theme of this year, 2022, is strengthening resilience in nutrition and food security on the African continent, strengthening agro-food systems, health and social protection systems for the acceleration of human, social, and economic capital development. That's quite a long theme. This theme is particularly pertinent today 
As we mark this day, we also recognize our citizens from all over the world, and especially our youth, for the immense contributions they have made for Africa and the world at large. Dear citizens, ladies and gentlemen, permit me here to say a few words about our youth and some of the AU's initiatives towards our youth development. Africa is the youngest population in the world, with more than 400 million young people aged between the ages of 15 to 35 years. A youthful population such as this certainly calls for increased investments in economic and social development factors in order to improve the development index of African nations. The AU has developed quite a number of youth policies and programs with the aim of ensuring Africa benefits from its demographic dividend. These policies, as you are most aware, include the African Youth Charter, Youth Decade Plan of Action, and the Malabo Decision on Youth Empowerment, all of which were implemented through the AU Agenda 2063 programs. As agents of change and the largest population of the youth ever, African youth are the architects of the future. It is therefore crucial to support them, to co-create with them, and to ensure gender inclusivity at every stage so that collective progress is achieved without anyone being left behind. It is vital for the younger generation, especially the women, to recognize and explore their potential through meaningful inclusion and participation across sectors for the benefit of continent and our diaspora. We believe that we should commit ourselves more to harmonizing our efforts to enhance our youth productivity in order to advance socioeconomic development in our continent. And as we celebrate today, we should look towards more coordinated and concerted actions towards accelerating youth empowerment and development in line with the decade of action as espoused in Agenda 2063 and in line with the Agenda 2030 of the United Nations. Uh, with this uh, few remarks, I wish all Africans of the continent and of the diaspora a happy anniversary. God bless Africa. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, my ambassador and PR will have been here today, but at the last minute he had an urgent need to represent the sovereign somewhere outside of New York and has asked me to deliver this statement on his behalf. I have the honor to deliver these remarks on the celebration of the 2022 African Day. African Day is a day set aside to celebrate and acknowledge the successes of the defunct Organization of African Unity, now AU, from its creation on May 25, 1963, with the ultimate objective of liberating Africa from the yoke of colonialism, apartheid, and racism. While the first two have been achieved, we are yet to eradicate racism which has cast a blight on our humanity. Thus, the eradication of racism and racial discrimination will continue to be our objective as a people, and will continue to define our common humanity. This day is significant in many respects. One, it reinforces African solidarity, unity in diversity, common strategy to challenges, and consolidated successes and the economic potential of the continent and its people. And through this day, awareness and consciousness is raised about the situation in Africa and the determination of its people to be liberated politically, economically, and socially. The theme of this year's celebration, strengthening resilience in nutrition and food security on the African continent, strengthening agro-food systems, health, and social protection systems for the acceleration of human, social, and economic capital development is quite apt because no country or continent can develop without first being able to feed its people. Over the last decade, Africa has grown more dependent on imported agricultural goods instead of developing its own. We can reverse this trend through management of the food value chain that enhances professional job opportunities for people that offer them distant living and career. 
What can be more rewarding and contributing to feeding your own population and making a nation resilient against external shocks? As we mark this important day of ours, let me first and foremost pay tribute to our fallen African heroes and heroines who paid the ultimate price in the struggle for independence, liberation of the continent, and AU peace support missions in pursuit for peace and security in the continent in order to attain the African vision of an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa. Excellencies and distinguished guests, on 31st January 2015, the African Union Assembly adopted Agenda 2063, a historical grand long-term plan for our economic and social development in pursuit of an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa that is driven by its own citizens. Through the adoption of this blueprint for our development, our leaders will issue a clarion call for us to come together as Africans and work collectively to build a common future that is free from fear and free from want. They were setting us clearly on the path towards the Africa we want. The food crisis that have been triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic, droughts in most part of Africa, insecurity that we see perennial water scarcity, and of course, the recent war in Ukraine is a stark reminder that we Africans must take responsibility for feeding our populations. It is so sad to note that Africa, with vast arable land and favorable climate, imports agricultural products worth over 60 billion US dollars every year. If Africa were self-sufficient, it could deploy or finance long-term investments with these funds. As we continue to pursue this path, it is with a sober recognition that the journey is not smooth and without challenges. Today, the reality of instability and conflict are compounded by climate change and the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic, which no doubt affected the African continent and the world at large. What seems to be lacking, no doubt, is the political action to produce the necessary change. COVID-19 pandemic was a wake-up call, demonstrating the need for Africans to develop resilience in the health and social protection sectors. We must use this opportunity to promote long-term solutions to Africans' food, in the food dependence. The unfortunate reality is that for many years, the media also have been painting a negative image of the continent. We need more reporting on the positive stories and the progress that is taking place all across the continent. For example, global media reports are scant about the minor innovative solutions African entrepreneurs have Im implemented to overcome the pandemic. Excellencies, distinguished guests, as we celebrate African Day in this challenging environment, let us acknowledge that climate crisis is not simply an environmental crisis. It is also fundamentally a crisis that threatens the sovereignty of member states and in many ways, the fundamental freedoms and human rights of our people. It threatens our way of life and who we are as Africans. It also threatens our food security. It also it is a certainty that unless decisive measures are taken to address the issue of climate change, the disruption caused by human actions to the natural world will lead to more pandemics in the future and exacerbate poverty and food crisis. Of importance is imperative to enhance our preparedness and capacity for response. Distinguished guests, Africa is richly endowed with vast human and natural resources, which if harnessed in accordance with our vision, the Agenda 2063 will improve the livelihood of people of Africa through the rapid eradication of hunger, poverty, and disease. As I conclude, African Day has become a day of celebration for Africans and people of African descent all over the world. And has even morphed into <coughs> African Month, which is celebrated throughout the month of May. I would like to take the liberty to join all Africans to celebrate this day. <coughs> the day is also an opportunity to reflect on the progress made by the African Union in achieving its goals, 
especially with regard to protecting the human rights and freedoms of Africans. Same as last year, 2021, the commemoration of Africa Day in 2020 comes at a rather difficult time with challenges posed by COVID-19 pandemic, armed conflict, climate change, violent extremism all over Africa, or some parts of Africa, sorry, terrorism, poverty and hunger. Our message today, we therefore focus on the need to find and amplify innovative solutions that are aimed at addressing challenges on the continent. Africa has, has had its fair share of armed conflict, and now is the time to put an end to such and to such and focus on our development. As a continent, Africa should capitalize on its potential and leverage on its endowment. <coughs> we should draw inspiration from a population that has the potential to change the narrative. On this African day, let us rededicate ourselves to fruitful partnerships in pursuit of peace and sustainable progress for all the continents of the of people. You must work together as a people in the continent to overcome our prevailing challenges, which include combating health issues, poverty, climate change, ecological issues, hunger, economic freedom, improving the quality of education, and mediating in civil wars, amongst others. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Namdi, for your uh, thought-provoking statement. It's now my pleasure to welcome Ms. Zane Asha, news anchor from CNN, to give her remarks. Over to you, Zane. Okay. Thank you so much, Hawa. Thank you so much, Jamal. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So um, I want to start by sharing a story that had a real significant impact on me. And that is, back in March, I was on a flight from Lagos to Atlanta, and I was speaking with one of the flight attendants. It was a Delta flight. And he said to me that one of the strangest things about flying out of Africa, um, especially Lagos, he said, was that there, were, there are comparatively a higher number of deaths that take place on the flight compared to flying out of other regions in the world. And I said to him, what, what do you mean by that? And he said that there are a lot of people who leave, for example, Lagos and head to the United States for a medical procedure, say, for example, and they don't make it um, to the United States and they end up passing away on the flight. He also said that with that, there also ha ha you know, there happens to be a lot of medical emergencies that take place on the flight as well. So, for example, you might have a woman who is nine, nine and a half months pregnant, who boards a flight headed to America, hoping, of course, to give birth in the United States so that the child uh, is American. And he's seen it before where, you know, she ends up giving birth on the flight. And of course, generally speaking, not always, your child gets a citizenship from wherever the child is born. And so the plane has to make an emergency landing is what happened to him um, in Liberia. Therefore, instead of the child having American citizenship, the child was Liberian. So he said deaths and medical emergencies on flights out of Africa were just far more prominent um, and far more frequent compared to flying out of Europe. And as I listened to him say that, I just thought it was one of the saddest things I'd ever heard. This idea that everything in the Western world must be better. That I would rather risk my life, get on a flight out of Africa when I'm 40 weeks pregnant in order for my child to be born anywhere but here. And it really made me sit and think. You know, we are all aware and we all talk about the vibrancy and the dynamism and the young population and the continent's vast potential. But as we are writing Africa's future, how do we make sure that everybody partakes in that future? As many of us still cling to this old notion that we must give birth to our children abroad, we must educate them abroad, we must care for our health abroad, we must buy our clothes from abroad. But the fact is, and we have to remember that everything that we've come to value and love 
about abroad would not even be possible without Africa. Africa has sustained Africa has sustained and powered everything we crave about the Western lifestyle. If you live in America and you drink coffee, if you drink tea, if you have a cell phone, if you eat chocolate, if you wear a wedding ring, if you ride a bicycle, if you drive a car, if you play computer games, so much of the lifestyle that the Western world has come to love and depend on is powered by Africa. And yet those opportunities and the wealth from those opportunities are not trickling down to those who need it. But from the moment we wake up, especially if you live here in America, you reach and you switch off your alarm, you turn on your cell phones, you scroll through, you reach for your cup of coffee, you drive to work, you switch on your laptop in the offices, Africa is responsible, Africa is behind all of it. So how do we make sure that Africans can share in that? Firstly, it starts, of course, with education. We are all aware that there are millions of children across the continent who spend their days hacking the earth with picks and chisels, looking for gold or diamonds instead of going to school. Or the countless children who risk and fear being kidnapped in places like northeastern Nigeria for the mere act of showing up to school on a Monday morning. So either we reaffirm our commitments to keeping schools safe and keeping children in school, or we also additionally provide alternative learning centers. And to add to that, we also have to ask ourselves, what is the loss? What is the loss when a Congolese child stop goes, stops going to school so they can work in a coltan mine, or an Ivoirian child gives up a promising future as a nurse to harvest cocoa? What have we lost by squandering that potential? Have we lost a cure for cancer? Have we lost a solution to climate change? Secondly, we need to build a crop of leaders that can harness the continent's potential. And I'm not just talking about <laughs> political leaders, um, but also leaders across all segments of society. To be frank, leaders who are genuinely motivated by public good instead of by self-interest. And thirdly, Governments need to create the right environment to allow businesses to thrive and create jobs and opportunities that trickle down to the masses instead of just the middle class. So we don't have an environment where flight attendants on Delta are complaining that Africans are dying at a much higher rate in their desperation to leave their country. Thank you. It is now my uh, pleasure to uh, give the floor to the Goodwill Ambassador of the African Renaissance and Diaspora Network, who has worked uh, tirelessly uh, to put together the theme song for ARDN. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to give you the floor. Keju, please. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, I would like to say a big thank you to Dr. Jibril and the entire ARDN team for the opportunity to serve. Thank you, sir. Um, we must all stand together and say no to all forms of violence and discrimination against women and girls. <clears throat> That's why we came up with this new initiative, the ARDN Red Card Campaign Song, titled Stop Violence and Discrimination, featuring Wendy Shea from Ghana, Nukembo Zikori from South Africa, Spice Diana from Uganda, Perola from Angola, so we are Ramos from Cape Verde. Stop Violence and Discrimination is now available on all online music stores. Please, please, uh, let's support by streaming the song online. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you 2022 ARDN campaign song, Stop Violence and Discrimination, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Perula and I'm a fearless musician from Angola. I'm very happy and excited to say that I took part of the official red card campaign song, Stop Violence and Discrimination. This campaign is about fighting all forms of discrimination and abuse against girls and women. We must all stand together and say that discrimination and abuse must stop. The beautiful song will be available online in all music stores by the 25th of May. So please, download the song to support our campaign. Oh. 
Hi everyone, I Africa and to the rest of the world. My name is Spice Diana from Uganda 256 and I'm so honored to be part of the Red Card uh, single project featuring our uh, different stars in Africa and we are saying no to discrimination, to violence against women and girls in Africa. So this project is gonna be out on the 25th of May on all digital platforms. Make sure you stream, make sure you pass on the message cause we are together in this. We are saying no to all sorts of discrimination and violence against women and girls in Africa. Stay blessed. I'm Wendy Shea, a proud Ghanaian woman and I support the Red Card campaign an international initiative to fight against all forms of abuse and discrimination against girls and women. Growing up in my community, I saw women endure abuse and discrimination. Even though they support their families by taking care of their children, keeping up the household all, while holding down stressful and demanding jobs that doesn't give them equal compensation as their male counterparts. Watching this unfair and unethical treatment of girls and women, I vow to do everything in my power to help stop this gross treatment of girls and women. So I have lent my voice in support of the Red Card campaign song, Stop Violence and Discrimination, that will be released worldwide and premiered at the United Nations headquarters in New York on May 25th. So I urge each and every one of you to support this campaign by downloading the official campaign song, Stop Violence and Discrimination, available on all online music stores. Hi, my name is Soraya Ramos. I'm from Cape Verde, and I'm also an advocate for the fair treatment of girls and women. I have lent my voice in support to the official red card campaign song Stop the Violence and Discrimination. Please support our campaign by download Stop Violence and Discrimination available on all online music stores. <laughs> To be in this world filled with love Oh man, but it's Andrew Oh, Chocha, Chica, Lechiwa
So this is a special song that will be, and as of today, the theme song for the red card campaign, giving a red card to all forms of discrimination and violence against women and girls. Thank you to the producer. Thank you to the five artists, one of whom, uh, Nongkebo, is also a goodwill ambassador of the African Renaissance and Diaspora Network. Thank you very much again, Akeju, our goodwill ambassador. Uh, it is now uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce all the way from uh, Rwanda, Uli Keita, uh, the uh, executive director of uh, Youth Connect uh, Africa. Should be live online from uh, Kigali. Members of the Board of the African Renaissance and Diaspora Network, representatives of the African Union and member states, representatives of the United Nations, representatives of academia, civil society organizations, and the media, distinguished guests, all protocol observed. Good afternoon or good evening to some of us. 
On behalf of the Youth Connect Africa Hub, I would like to convey my sincere gratitude and appreciation to Dr. Jibril Jalu, the President and CEO of the African Renaissance and Diaspora Network, for inviting Youth Connect Africa to partake in this important Africa Day celebration at the United Nations. May 1963 is a significant date for the African continent. Our forefathers, such as Kwame Kuruma of Ghana, Modibo Keita of Mali, Sekou Toure of Conakry, and others have created the Organization for African Unity, which later became the African Union. Almost 60 years ago, they had the vision of uniting Africans as a people for political, social, and economic development. And today, Africans everywhere, whether in the diaspora or living on the continent, still hope for that same vision. Today, Africa is reaffirming this vision of continental unity as demonstrated by the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, AFCFTA. Africans are committed to peace, security, and sustainable development. We are making progress. To ensure we implement this continental vision in a sustainable manner, we must seriously take into account the most precious resource this continent has to offer, which is its young people. As Ms. Yuman mentioned in her welcome remarks, the youth represents 70% of the population in Sub-Saharan Africa. This is indeed the driver for economic growth and development, a vehicle for creating millions of jobs, reduce poverty, and lift the standard of living for generations of Africans. To achieve the development that we seek, young people must be empowered to fulfill their potential and be able to participate in decision-making levels at all levels. They must not simply be observers at the meetings of policy-making bodies. As a continent, we must harness this demographic dividend by investing in their education, their empowerment, providing them decent jobs, and encouraging entrepreneurship as a pathway to economic development. This is precisely why Youth Connect Africa was created to connect young people to social economic transformation. Youth Connect Africa is a continental youth empowerment initiative that has been adopted by many African Union members with the desire to empower young people. Youth Connect Africa endeavors to harness the demographic dividend through investment in the youth. This mission is driven by our governments in Africa and young adults of Africa's most valuable resources. Education is essential to empowering their futures and the future of Africa. There is room for every member nation of the African Union on our campus. Let education be the guidepost for everyone to continue the progression of the African Union. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Resino, for that statement. And we look forward to following up uh, with you with this excellent uh, connection. Thank you again. Thank you very much. It is now my pleasure to introduce uh, the uh, video message from the Deputy Executive Director of UNFPA, Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, Dr. Jane Keita. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear young people, my dearest brother Jibril, bonjour à tous, good afternoon. It is my great honor to join you today in celebrating Africa Day. Today is an important day to celebrate Africa's achievement towards sustainable development as envisioned in Agenda 2063, 
the Africa we want. A day like this gives us the opportunity to recognize and celebrate Africa's leadership. Africa was the first to have a continental charter on youth, which is guiding youth development and empowerment across the continent. It is also important to recognize the bold decision by the African head of state to devote the team of the African Union to harnessing the demographic dividend. This has a positive ripple effect across Africa and beyond. It is no surprise that Africa's Agenda 2063 is strongly aligned with the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I strongly believe for the continent to move forward towards attaining all sustainable development goals, we have to harness the potential of African people, especially its women and youth. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the founders of the Organization of African Unity showed great resolve and unity of purpose in leading the continent towards common values of freedom, equality, human rights, and dignity. Dear young people, we count on your generation to build on the effort of the present leadership through your innovative thinking, resilience, and dedication. The United Nations Population Fund and the entire UN system will continue to be Africa's close partner in the journey towards the Africa we want. The Sahel Women Empowerment and Demographic Dividend Project and the Karma Campaign to Reduce Maternal Mortality are excellent examples of the African Union's ambitious yet critical investment towards realizing sustainable development. However, COVID-19 has impacted people all over the world and in Africa as well, and has severely disrupted some of the gains made over the years. This calls for increasing investment and accelerating action towards realizing the aspiration for Agenda 2063 and the Sustainable Development Goals Agenda 2030. As UNFPA, we are equally committed to supporting efforts by the African Union aimed at addressing the humanitarian crisis, including support for the Humanitarian Summit and other programs within the continent from the Sahel to the Horn of Africa to the Great, region, Great Lake region. We have continuously been on the ground ensuring that the needs of the most vulnerable are addressed, especially women and youth, leaving no one behind. Ladies and gentlemen, young people, we must remember that the Africa we want must be the one we build. It is too important to leave it to chance or to business as usual. Allow me to thank you all for seizing this opportunity for Africa Day 2022 to appreciate a few of the many excellent developments that are changing our lives. Have a wonderful Africa Day. That was the message from the United Nations Fund for Population. And now it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce the message specially done for this day for uh, the celebrations of Africa Day by the Deputy Executive Director of UN Women. Go ahead, please. Your Excellencies, young leaders of Africa and in the diaspora, friends and partners, I join you today on behalf of UN Women in celebrating Africa Day, a day devoted to collective struggles for liberation, decolonization, and also for the celebration of the continent's diversity and culture. I am thrilled that this year's celebration is dedicated to youth leadership, talent, and influence in all aspects of society and civic space. UN Women is committed to creating a space for partnership which is intersectional and intergenerational to advance gender equality as showcased in the landmark 
Generation Equality Forum last year. It is critical that young people, including adolescents, in all their diversity are engaged in peace, development, and human rights. I say this in what are sobering times for all of us as we deal with the impact of war, climate change, and acute economic inequality. Almost 75% of Africa's population is young, under the age of 35 years. And yet, from 2013 to 2017, the rate of unemployed youth across Africa actually increased from 16 to almost 18%. The rate of youth not engaged in education, employment, or training also increased rather dramatically from 19 to 28% during the same period, and it continues to rise. The fact is that given this demographic and given these numbers, the continent is losing money. The continent could reap approximately $500 billion more each year if countries invested in youth. Research also indicates that there are tens of billions of dollars in increased GDP that would come from ensuring that girls complete their education and fulfill their potential in our societies. We have an opportunity to leverage this demographic dividend as a unique driver for economic growth and development, an opportunity to create several million jobs that can lead to reduced poverty, will help to lift the standard of living, not just for this generation, but also for the next generation of Africans. Our solutions will require transformative shifts and integrated intergenerational approaches. We know that existing interventions will not suffice to achieve a planet 50-50 by 2030. So what we need are innovative approaches that disrupt business as usual and that will deliver the SDGs. I want to say also that through generation equality, we will continue to partner with young people in Africa and across the diaspora to strengthen your active participation and your leadership in accelerating gender equality and empowerment of all young women and girls. It is time to scale up action and impact on youth employment in particular to support the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. We need to spotlight existing talent and consolidate the bold progress that the 2063 Agenda envisages through intergenerational partnerships. Together with the African Union, and in close partnership with the Special Envoy on Women, Peace and Security, we have been participating in the African Women Leaders Network and in its intergenerational retreats since inception in 2018. This network is an intergenerational platform for young women to network with an inspiring group of African women leaders, including senior UN leaders, current government representatives, and several former heads of state. It is through initiatives like this and through young people's transformative advocacy that we can have a direct impact on achieving equality and prosperity, the cornerstones of Agenda 2063 and the SDGs. Let us make a commitment today to continue to work together in achieving these goals. Thank you. We are so grateful to partner UN agencies for taking time out of the programs to really make these special videos. So uh, now we will be having a live connection with the uh, former uh, first vice president of Costa Rica, uh, Her Excellency Epsi Campbell Barr. Uh, before then, I wanted to just recognize uh, three individuals as we go along. We have uh, Professor Leonard Jeffries here uh, who is a historian, very, very famous. We want to make sure that we recognize you, Professor Jeffries. Uh, we have Rosalind Jeffries, uh, Dr. Jeffries in her own right as well. 
and Charles Martins. And the Mayor of New York City is represented by the Chief of Staff, but also the person who has been working tirelessly to have the connection with the diaspora. I'm talking about Aisata Kamara here present. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we have been talking about bringing all facets of society to work on giving a red card to all forms of discrimination uh, against women and girls. Sharon Kumbabach, here present, is going to bring the world of fashion to give a red card against all forms of discrimination and violence against women and girls. Please stand up so that we can thank you as well for, for doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very important. So we want to now have the connection with uh, the former uh, first vice president of Costa Rica, uh, Her Excellency uh, Campbell Barr. You have the floor. Is it technical? Yeah, technician. yeah. Mm. the technicians. Yeah, okay. Mm. It's an honor to be for me as a as a woman of African descent, and it is a great honor to be part of this celebration. Today we celebrate the date of Africa to vindicate all the socioeconomic advances that have been achieved by the majority of the countries in this continent. This celebration, Orange has its foundation since the Congress of African States was held for the first time where representatives of several countries met. That meeting showed the firm determination of the people to freeze themselves for foreign colonization. In addition to celebrating Africa Day, we must celebrate African legacy to the world in its music, art, fashion, unique fabrics, design, dance, cuisine, economics, its supporting achievement, among many others. I'm so that here we can take a pledge to make sure that we do everything possible to work towards ending violence and discrimination against women and girls. The world needs your power and innovation now more than ever. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Now, I'm one of those people who does spend a little bit of time on social media, TikTok, Instagram, you name it. And I was pleasantly surprised when I was looking in my Facebook and I, I saw that Jibril was being honored at Webster University. I mean, I jumped out of my seat and I felt, I mean, I really felt proud because I thought, oh my God, Webster University, first I'm searching, where is that? Oh my God, this is where it is? And to have a fellow African taking the message of uh, Arden, taking the message of the United Nations, the world, but the message of Africa uh, to Webster University, it gave me goosebumps. And it really just made me realize, again, as we said, Jibril Diallo, the, the passion that he has, the energy, and that really um, you know, idea of building bridges and building, you know, bringing the world together. So thank you so much, Jibril, once again. I'm sorry I have to say this over and over again, not because he's my mentor, <laughs> but because really, uh, as an individual, as uh, a person, I'm really um, honored and proud of the work that he does. Now, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Ramnek Aluwali, Aluwalia, the CEO of Higher Ed, who will bring us his message via video. Let's watch this now. Greetings to everyone on Africa Day. Uh, my name is Professor Ramnika Luwalia. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Higher Health, 
um, an organization serving Southern Africa. Um, we are very rich as a continent. And today my speech is focused on hope, a hope of a wonderful Africa, of a fantastic Africa, of Africa that will lead and is deservingly to lead. Uh, we are an unfortunate continent. South Africa, as an example, is just 27 years old in its democracy as an independent country. We've, as a continent, as a country, inherited a difficult past, a past that has put way and miles us behind. But what has not taken from us is our desire, our will, and our, our determination to go back and, and, and deserve what Africa deserves to be the best in the world. A widening inequality gap is not our doing. It's something, as we always say in South Africa, a 27 years of independence, it takes time for transformation. And that's what we are hoping and we're trying to build. A build from what West says is a dark continent to be the most brightest sunshine that, that will lead the world in the future.